welcome to what is now week four in the Dancing Dragonflies Knit Along. This has been a weekly get together live on Facebook at 3 p.m. every Friday for the month of April. And we have been working on our Dancing Dragonfly mitten pattern. And yes, I have completed my first mitten and I'm about halfway up on my second. So this is a Canadian designer pattern by Sarah L. Kelly. I'll put the link below in the comments after the video. And we have been working our way through in a fingering weight hand dyed yarn, um, either the Malabrigo sock, which is a superwash merino, or the River Riverside Studio, which is a combination of superwash merino, cashmere, and nylon. It just takes 100 gram skein of your main color and your contrast color and it's especially pretty if you have a contrast color with some variation or speckles throughout. So we've posted some of the progress pics on the events page. You'll find that at the top of our Facebook homepage. Click on events, go to Dancing Dragonflies Knit Along and you can see um, everyone's progress and um, please feel free to say hello in the comments let us know where you're watching us from what things are like in your corner of the world progress on your knitting whatever you'd like to tell us hi Joanne hi Lee I hope everybody's made great progress I started to notice more of the knit alongs this week are starting their second mitten and they do say it goes much quicker than the first one because you're a little bit more familiar with the stitches, your tension, and um, reading the pattern as well. I will come and show you close to the camera my finished mitten so you can see how it's turned out. And the thumb is complete. And I did choose to do the liner, so it's just tucked to the inside. So that's the Knit One Pearl One liner, which can create a longer cuff if needed, or tucked inside the Feral cuff as a thicker, warmer layer and to keep the drafts out. And I have embellished my dragonfly eyes with silver metallic beads which I've stitched on at the very end. So I'm really happy with how the first one has turned out. And the important thing now is just to keep up my rhythm on the second mitten. I probably will finish it this weekend. So I'm just gonna go over all the tips. Um, if you're just starting your mittens now, or if you're thinking of doing a second pair, it's always good to um, check in with tips and see if there's anything you can do differently the second time around. We did have a knit longer here for curbside pickup uh, yesterday and she had finished one of her mittens and she had bought yarn now to do another three pairs for Christmas so that's very exciting. Hi Leslie, two mitts are done. Just the thumbs to do now. Awesome. Hi Andrea. Andrea's still on mitten number one. That's perfectly fine. It's such an enjoyable project. You don't want to rush through it. Hi Catherine. Oh, thank you. I'm going to be really interested to see how you embellish your mittens after. Where you put the beads, if you put the beads on, if you do some metallic embroidery. I'll go over those embellishment ideas too. Um, and then we do have an incentive ballot to win later on at the end of the video, so please stay tuned for that. The grand prize is shown over here on my left, your right, and there will be a live prize drawn next Friday at 3 p.m. So please don't miss that and cheer on your fellow knit-alongers and see who's going to win. Inside the prize, we have a project with a pattern, so that includes yarn 
and there may be a few dragonflies floating around in there. Hi Shelly, thanks for joining us. Shelly is working on, I think, her first mitten, or are you on your second one now? Oh, hi Gwyneth, you're on your last thumb. Oh wow, you're way ahead of me. So just going over the tips. So as I mentioned, we did a alternate to the cast on explained in the pattern. So if you choose to do the alternate liner, which is knit one, purl one, or knit two, purl two, whatever you choose, then you are casting on the same number of stitches in your main color, same needle size. The only thing is you're going to do the equal number of rounds according to what you would do in the cuff pattern. You would do that in the ribbing. And then instead of doing the two color cast on according to Sarah's pattern, because you've already cast on for your rib liner, you would then switch to do the Latvian braid as it's explained in the pattern for the bottom of the ferrule cuff and then of course the Latvian braid at the top of the ferrule cuff. So that's tip number one. Tip number two is you can choose double point needles or the nine inch circular, which I am working on. And I've actually grown quite accustomed to it now. So I've done the entire mitten this time, mitten number two on my nine inch circular. Mitten number one, I did double point 2.5 millimeter for the cuff liner and the ferrule cuff and at the top of the lapping braid I switched to the 9 inch circular just to give it um, a change and see if I would like it better. I was not sold on it until about three quarters of the way through the mitten and then I decided I liked it better than the, the double point needle so I'm still on it. I'll bring this closer so you can see how short it is. Generally we use 9 inch circular needles on socks, but they're just the right length for mittens, gloves as well. It does take quite a bit of getting used to for your fingers and your thumb. You have to find a different way to hold the needle tip because you have a very short tip to hang on to, but it can be done. And I did make a slight change on the second mitten in the pattern when it uh, refers to the incre increased round, which comes right after the Latvian braid at the top of the cuff. And it's just personal preference, but you might choose to do that on your next pair of mittens. So in the pattern, Sarah has explained to work 17 stitches and then knit into front and back of stitch number 18. I found that because those increased stitches worked out on a contrast color stitch, that it was creating a little bit of a bar that was pulling up and visible. So I instead started my increase on, I knit 16 stitches in the main color and then did my increase only on the main color stitches. So I'm increasing with black, in my case, main color, into a previous black stitch from the previous round. I just find that it didn't show as much that the increases were actually there. So that's a tip maybe to use on your next pair of mitts. Might be too late now. Uh, number four. Yes, so on the Latvian braid, some of you may be doing it for the first time. It's very simple to do. It's a bit tedious and slow, but it's very effective and you can see how pronounced it is. I'm suggesting that you keep your two colors of yarn looser than normal, just for the Latvian braid. That makes it more pronounced and much more effective as a design element. If you're new at doing the Latvian braid, your tendency is to pull each stitch very tightly. And then that poor little Latvian braid, the little bars that sort of slant one direction and then the opposite, 
they can look very tight and they'll disappear into the knitting. So try to do just that element looser than normal. And tip number five, I mentioned that in week one or week two, I was suggesting that um, when you're doing the ferrule work, the chart work, to knit in your float on every third stitch wherever possible so that your floats are not too long across the back. And I can show you on the inside of my mitten. Not many people will reveal the inside of their knitting, but I don't mind. So this is the inside of the palm, and this is the inside of the dragonfly area. So you sh really should not have floats that go more than three stitches. That will stop fingertips and the jewelry from catching the little bars as they're carried across every time the mitts are put on. So that is the inside. And then I did mention, I think in week number one, I usually mention it every time we're following a pattern with a chart, that um, the easiest way to read your, your charted rows is to put a little sticky note or a sticky tab. They're little clear, opaque highlighters. You can buy them at any stationery store. And you can just remove the sticky tab every time you finish one row and move it up. And that will give you a built-in ruler that doesn't move accidentally. And it's much easier to keep your place in the pattern. I also found that the little side stitches um, that are worked in between the start of the round, see the little dotted stitches that come down the side. That's your halfway point around the mitten. I found they, they were great little counters. So I could just count my contrast color, which is the blue-green, as two rounds. Two, four, six, eight, ten. And then I could always tell where I was on the chart as a backup. It's not entirely foolproof, but it's good to have a backup counting method. Uh, hi Nancy. Hi Shelly again. Shelly was pleasantly surprised in how much easier Latvian braid is when you're doing it rather than when you're reading about it. Yeah, sometimes in knitting um, Things that are explained that we haven't tried before, different techniques, can come across as quite mystifying and a challenge to do, but when you're actually sitting down doing it, it is much easier. That's a good thing. And um, tip number seven, okay. So the alternate method that I presented, I think last week, was about the top of the mitten, the final finish. And I was mentioning that um, traditionally the Latvian style mittens have the picket fence decreases. So they come to a very sharp point. And then as the pattern recommends, you would feed the last bit of yarn on a darning needle through the remainder of the stitches, pull it into a tight little circle and fasten and secure it. Very much like you do at the top of the hat. So if you found that when you wear mittens, your fingers want to spread apart a bit and not to feel so stiff and pointed into the center section there, the alternate method was to follow the chart to the very last round and then work one more round in the main color. For me, that's the black. And just do one more decrease round. So that gets rid of another four stitches. <clears throat> and then, <clears throat> excuse me, just grasped those remainder of stitches. So I think I wrote down 
that I had grafted six stitches at the front and six stitches at the back together. That way you're still getting a picket fence, but you're also getting the more North American style black tip. So that is something that is written up as a tech tip in our Dragonfly event page. So you can find uh, the information there if you forget and you want to do it on your next pair. And the other alternate that uh, we discussed was doing the afterthought thumb. My afterthought thumb is complete here. And I know many of you chose to do that method just for something uh, different, different variety, or maybe you thought it was easier. So the afterthought thumb means that you need a little bit of scrap yarn, and it should be the same thickness, fingering weight, but a high contrast color. So I chose a lime green that I can see quite well. And as I came to the thumb opening on the chart, all I did was knit across the same number of stitches as the pattern requires with my scrap yarn. And then I slipped those stitches that had just been knit in the scrap yarn back to the opposite needle. And I just continued knitting across the scrap yarn, the regular pattern round with my main color and contrast color. So basically I've just knit a stripe in that will not be staying there. And then after I finish the shaping at the top of my mitten, I'll go back with my double point needles to work the thumb and I'll pick up all the stitches that are directly below the scrap yarn. And then I'll flip it over and pick up all the stitches directly above the scrap yarn. Once I feel I've got all the stitches securely on two needles, I use a third double point needle and I very slowly unpick that scrap yarn. That's acting as a stitch holder and it will come out. It's best to just unpick it stitch by stitch instead of taking scissors and getting a little too brave or confident and trying to cut it out. It's so fine I would just be nervous that um, uh, stitches would be cut in the wrong place. And then once you get your stitches onto your double point needles, then you can start working the thumb directions exactly as the pattern specifies. And we did talk last week a little bit about picking up the two extra stitches in each of the corners. So you'd be knitting across the, from right to left, the lower bottom side of the thumb opening. You pick up two stitches as you turn to knit across the top of the thumb opening. When you pick up those two stitches, try to go under two bars in the corner or find a stitch that you can pick up that does not leave a large hole. It's a little bit of trial and error, but I know you can do it. And then we also pick up two stitches at the opposite side before we join in the round. Uh, leave a nice length of your main color yarn when you're starting the thumb because no matter how carefully you pick up stitches in the corner, you're still going to have what we call stress areas. And that's where one or two stitches are being pulled from opposite directions. And the more the mitts are worn, those holes tend to get a little bit bigger. So all I do is I take my tail end of the yarn where I started knitting the thumb after and I look at the corner and I see, okay, you know, I can see where the hole is. I sew around the hole and I try to catch the four points of the hole from underneath. It's like invisible mending. And then I weave across the same tail end to the opposite side of the thumb opening and I do the same thing. I try to see where the stress is coming from, what stitches are pulling, and I'm just reinforcing them and making them a little more secure at the back. Do it on the inside because if you do it on the right side, it'll look a little thick and noticeable. 
Um, what else can I tell you? The thumb can be shortened or lengthened. It's a very easy feral pattern if you want to add a few extra rounds. You're still keeping in the chart. And basically you can just try on your thumb as you're knitting it. The decrease section at the top is going to take up about half an inch. So where you feel your thumb is starting to round and shape, that's where you should start the decreasing. I was able to work the same number of rounds as the pattern called for. I didn't have to do any shaping, but I know a few of you have changed the number of rounds there and added a few more or taken a few away. We didn't do any different uh, decreasing. We followed the thumb shaping at the top exactly as it was written. And another tip too, when you're finishing off the tip of your thumb, the pattern is asking you to cut the yarn, thread it onto a darning needle, and then sew through the remainder of the stitching, tighten and secure. I always suggest that um, you sew around once through the stitches and then sew around a second time because there's a lot of um, stress put on the top of the mitten tip when it's being worn. People just tend to, like people when they're wearing socks, they tend to want to poke their toes through. Well, imagine what they'll do with the mitten. They just look for anything that feels like they can push and that might loosen up the end. So try to sew around twice through the same number of stitches in the same direction. And then when you are sewing in your ends, we always go horizontally through the back of the stranding. We don't want to sew vertically because those ends will pop out. There's more stretch in the mitten lengthways than there is widthways. So if you have your yarn threaded on a darning needle, you're trying to sew like a wave at the back of the stranded work. You're picking up the little bars, contrast color or main color, and those are the bars that were carried across in the stranding method, and they will not be noticeable at the front, and you're trying to keep your stitches relaxed as you're sewing, you're not tightening it up, because that will just pop out and the ends will undo. A little bit of extra gear. And you'll find that the ends, if you sew in for one half inches, um, they tend to mat together. Pure wool will mat together and it's just yarns that have slipped to them like a cotton, a silk, or a viscose that you would have to sew one way and then back the other way for extra grip. So those are all my tips. I think I, I did eight tips. Um, and then the final step is the blocking. So I have not blocked mitten number one. I'm going to wait until I finish the second one. And all I'm going to do is fill up a bowl with um, room temperature water and add in a bit of the Eucalan wool wash. This is like a half a cap because it's a small item. And then I'll swish it around to get the suds in action and I will squeeze the mitts into the suds so they really absorb the moisture and then just let them soak for 20 minutes. I'll come back, I will squeeze the excess moisture out of my mittens, roll them in a towel to really get rid of the moisture as much as possible, and then I'm just going to hand block them, no pinning required, and that just means I'm going to lay them flat on a drying surface and um, just shape them a little bit, you know, make sure the end or the edge doesn't curl up. I'll flatten that out and if I need a bit of extra length or extra width, I can shape them with my hands by pulling while they're still wet. Because good wool has memory and it will keep the shape that you put it in. That should take maybe an overnight or a day and a half to dry depending on the humidity in the air and then of course you can choose your final embellishment so I have put on the little silver bee just for the eye so that takes eight beads altogether 
I just happen to have some in a box. I have lots of silver, bronze, and gold metallics in the same size. If anybody needs them, feel free to send me a message or give me a call and I can put them in a little bag and um, you can pick them up curbside. And I know some of you are embellishing the border as our wonderful museum worthy pair of mitts inspired us to do. Uh, if you've missed that, we did have a mid logger who finished these in the first week and she actually did embellish her border by knitting in two different bead styles, a square and a circular one in between each flower motif. And then she also chose to knit in beads into all four wings of the dragonfly and the upper dragonfly all four wings. So that creates a nice weight to the mittens and makes them very artful and one of a kind. Afterwards she took a very fine silver thread, metallic thread, and she just did some duplicate stitches over the body of the dragonfly and that gives it the extra lurex type sparkle. She did not put any beads for the eyes. I think that probably would have been too much given all the bead work she's done. And then she chose a larger bead at the very top and knit that into the floral motif. So that should give you some nice ideas for embellishment. I probably will do the silver metallic for the body of my dragonflies. I'm going to wait till I finish mitten number two and then maybe block them, let them dry, stare at them for a while and let them speak to me and tell me what they would like. But I would love to see your pictures of how you embellish them. It might even be fun to do a little twisted cord tassel here at the outside edge of each mitten. That would make it look um, even more Latvian. Okay, so I'm going to give you a little bit of dragonfly trivia and then we'll go into our incentive ballot uh, questions and you'll have to be standing by at the comments to type in your answer there. The um, ballot box is even more full this week because we did have some more um, middle longers signing up. So it's never too late to start. All the um, tips and tutorials will stay forever in the event page. So did you know dragonflies are sometimes confused with damselflies? And the easiest way to tell them apart is by the wings. Dragonfly wings are flat and extend from the body outwards. Damselfly wings fold inwards along the body when in their resting position. Other than that, they both have iridescent colors and large eyes, and they both frequent wet habitats. So I really could not tell the difference between the two, but then I started to notice the wings. So damsel wings are flat like this, and dragonfly wings are outward. Just imagine now you're going to know so much more about dragonflies. Okay, so for our incentive ballot, we're just going to pick one randomly chosen uh, comment. And um, the question is, please post in the comment one of the techniques used on the Dancing Dragonfly mittens. So just one of the techniques. You can pick any one. There's no real wrong answer. And we certainly have had quite a few techniques to work through. Oh yes, damselflies do exist. And they don't bite humans. Either do dragonflies. Okay, we're getting some comments. And they're all good. 
So now I wanted to show you something that's totally unrelated to dragonflies, but it may help you with your knitting. And it's just a, a personal, um, uh, pro it's a product that I tried last night and I personally like it. You might not like it. And it's not endorsed by any sort of company. So this is Sally Hansen Hydrating Hand Mask. I had read good things about it. A friend had suggested it to me. My hands were so dry from all the sanitizing that we're doing now and also from the winter indoor heating, all that. So I tried these last night. They're, it's called a hand mask, but it's actually two gloves. I can show you what they look like. And it is an amazing, amazing product product it makes you feel so good so these are there's two of these gloves in the package it's not the stretchy kind of latex that has a smell and feels horrible I don't really know what it's made of but it's very comfortable and inside each of the gloves it's filled with macadamia oil shea butter and vitamin E and it smells heavenly it's not a strong scent I, I can't handle strong scents. This is very mild, but really very calming. And all you do is you put one on each hand with a little sticky tab to tighten it up around the wrist. It's not messy, nothing was coming out. I was still able to actually use my text on my phone with the gloves on. I wasn't able to knit, and they suggest you leave them on for 15 minutes. As you're wearing each glove, it warms up your hand warms up so the moisturizer becomes more liquefied and all you do is sort of massage your hand glove to glove contact and then take them off and your hands will look 10 times younger and they just feel wonderful they also have the same sort of product for feet it's called a foot mask so i will be trying that one next so this little package you can get at a drugstore uh, it's called Sally Hansen Hydrating Hand Mask. And as a knitter, you probably know that when your hands are feeling rough, that um, the yarn can catch on it, and it's just not a nice feeling. So keeping your hands well moisturizes all part of good knitting. Okay, so we've got lots of answers coming in. So that is all I can tell you for today. That's the end of uh, week four, actually the end of the knit along. We will be having um, a knit along coming up in the next probably month and a half. So stay tuned for that and don't miss next Friday, 3 p.m. The live draw right here for this lovely uh, package of goodies. And I hope you enjoyed knitting your mitts. I hope you learned a few new tips, tech, tech tips and um, techniques. It's all part of knitting, being patient and trying something new each time. Thanks for joining me.